Our subject in this, our third session this evening, is the corporation and limited existence. The corporation and limited existence. The word corporation and the concept of the corporation are both very important to us theologically. The word corporation comes from the Latin corpus, meaning a body. The idea of a corporation can be found to a limited degree in Rome, but the essentials of the concept of the corporation as we know it in the modern world come to us straight out of the Bible. Corporation is a legal person. It is a body which has an existence even though the members thereof die. The church is a corporation. It is the body of Christ. The concept of a corporation, of course, goes back to the Old Testament. Israel, the Old Testament church was a corporation. And as such, it was very often purged, captivity, <coughs> judgment, and disasters of various sorts separated a sizable body of the people from Israel. But Israel, as the city of God, continued and Israel, as the new Israel of God, the church, the kingdom of God, continues. Now the state very early saw the threat in Christ and in Christianity and the whole corporate concept of the church. Here was a transcendental power, that is, a power from beyond this world, a power that said it could not be touched, whose king was in heaven and is in heaven and governs from there. And so the state reacted in two ways. First, as with Rome in the early days, it warred against the church. It warred against any allegiance to Christ over the state. And this was the bitter conflict that led to persecutions and to martyrdom. But then second, the state attempted not only to take over the church and to control it, but to take over the very doctrine of the corporation and to become itself the corporation, the body of Christ. This doctrine persisted through the centuries, in fact, was developed. The language has changed now from what I'm going to be describing in that the theological terminology, the open allusions to Christ have been dropped, but the concept of the corporation as a living person, above and beyond all individuals who are members of it, a legal person, is still basic to our thinking. Sir Edward Coke, C-O-K-E, said that the state is a mystical body with a king as its head. Blackstone said that the king never dies because kingship is a continuing concept. The king, moreover, he said, is never legally under age. Also, he declared, and I quote, he is not only incapable of doing wrong, but even of thinking wrong. He can never mean to do an improper thing. In him is no uh, fel, uh, uh, fault nor weakness. Edmund Plowden said the political body is invisible and immortal, even as Christ is. The king was the incarnate sovereign. In Queen Elizabeth's day, Justices Southcote and Harper, according to the law report for that time, held, and I quote, The king has two capacities, for he has two bodies. The one whereof is a body natural, consisting of natural members, as every other man has, and in this he is subject to passions and death, as other men are. 
The other is a body politic, and the members thereof are his subjects. And he and his subjects together compose the corporation, as Southcote said. And he is incorporated with them, and they with him, and he is the head. And they are the members, and he has the sole government of them. And this body is not subject to passions as the other is, nor to death. For as to this body the king never dies, and his natural death is not called in our laws, Harper said, the death of the king, but the demise of the king, not signifying, signifying by that word demise that the body politic of the king is dead, but that there is a separation of the two bodies, and that the body politic is transferred and conveyed over from the royal body natural now dead, or now removed from the dignity royal to another body natural, so that it signifies the removal of the body politic of the king of this realm from one body natural to another, unquote. Now, this is simply a parody of the doctrine of Christ and his two natures. In 1401, Long before Queen Elizabeth's day, the Speaker of the House actually spoke of the body politic as being comparable to the Trinity and the Trinity, the King, the House of Lords, and Commons. Now, it is not surprising that this should have happened because Rome very early began to use the concept of the corporation and Christian doctrine for its own ends. And this became part and parcel of the paraphernalia of kings and of holy Roman emperors. In fact, very often the church went along with this in subscribing to this view of the state. Pope John VIII, whose dates are 872 to 882 in his papacy, said concerning the Carolingian Emperor Charles II, that he was the sovereign of the world whom, quote, God established as the prince of his people in imitation of the true king, Christ his son, so that what Christ owned by nature the king might attain by grace, unquote. So the king became a kind of Christ over this world, and the corporation, the body of the Christendom of his day was headed by himself. <laughs> Philip II of Spain was a Caesar papist who saw himself as head of the bishops of Spain. When later religious toleration began to come into European thought, it came in again with this concept of the state as the true corporation and the church as existing only to serve that body whose head is the civil ruler. Frederick the Great of Prussia, for example, on June 15, 1740, said, and I quote, All religions are equal and good insofar as those who profess them are honest men. And if the Turks and pagans come and want to populate the country, we should be ready to build their mosques and temples. The state should see to it that all religions lived in peace and worked together and in equal measure for the good of the state. What Frederick did first was to place all religions on a par under the state. All religions equal under the state. And the state said, we will finance them if we approve of them. Frederick had one condition, second, for all religions. Quote, insofar as those who profess them are honest men, unquote. Now, this is a very important phrase because it reflects so much of the Enlightenment thinking. The Enlightenment view of religion was that it was not a product of religion. Morality was not a product of religion, but of reason, right reason. And therefore, it was a philosophical attribute belonging to natural religion, which is a philosophical product. 
Thus, morality was separated from religion and in particular from Christianity. All religions could attain to the same moral level for Frederick through reason. Thus, religious toleration had as a premise first, that all religions are under the state and on a par, and second, that morality is a product of reason, not of religion, which is a most drastic demotion of religion, and third, the purpose of religious toleration, quote, for the good of the state, unquote. And with that, we have a return to pagan Rome. Because the idea of pagan Rome was that all religions should be licensed and controlled by the state for the good of the state, because they held religion is the most important social cement. It binds people together, and the very word for religion meant binding. Social cement for a state. What had happened was this, that first, the state now claimed to be the true corporation, the transcendental and necessary corporation of man, something beyond all men and beyond all institutions to govern them and to be the umbrella over them. The state is the new sovereign and the new agency of salvation according to this doctrine. And it is not surprising that in Prussia where this doctrine developed, statist education also began. And statist education thus had a messianic salvationist purpose as I develop in my book The Messianic Character of American Education. Then second, the state now saw the function of the church less and less as the service of Christ and more and more as the service of the state. The test was political utility. If the church or the religion did not meet that test of political unity, destroy it. This was what the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution and other revolutions have said. And third, the state was now the great community, the ultimate corporation. Hence, any other corporation could only be a subsidiary one. So all other corporations must go to the state to be licensed by the state. And that means especially the church. So we have had, especially since 1952, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service of the United States, saying to churches, you are not a corporation, you are not a body of Christ. Until we say you are, until we approve of you, until you meet our test, which is now, I believe, a 14-page questionnaire. If the state creates the corporation, it is what the English call all such state-created corporations the church, limited, LTD, limited. Because it has a limited existence, it is created by and exists on the sufferance of the state. And so the IRS today says you are a church only as long as we say you are. And we saw what that meant in California when in 1978 a number of churches from then to the present, have had their existence threatened. And all over the country, churches have had their existence threatened by state and federal agencies who say, we have created you and we can take away your life. A limited and a conditional existence. The modern state has thus become a new Christ. It no longer uses, as they did in the Middle Ages and a few centuries ago in the days of Elizabeth and other monarchs, the language of Christology, but it says the same thing. When the state says, we are the corporation, 
the supreme corporation. They are saying we are what the church once was. The institution that is beyond your reach to challenge. You have no right to question our right to existence. You have no right to say who made you a corporation? Who gave you the law that says you are beyond our reach? The modern state has borrowed the biblical doctrines for anti-Christian purposes. It is, therefore, very, very clearly a time for battle, to contend earnestly for the faith and for our deliverance from these evil doctrines. The corporation that God created is his body, the church. Are there any questions now about our subjects this evening? Yes. When you talk about the deity and the king, I think that's one of the reasons why so many English people are against Cromwell. Because he's not in the Westminster Abbey. He's not included Mm -hmm. in there with Livingston, Calhoun, all the greats of England. But they were too concerned what the king did. I think it was just because they considered him a deity or something. A very good point, because the hostility to this day in England to Cromwell is based upon the fact that he challenged totally this doctrine. As a matter of fact, when Charles II came to the throne, the regicides were tried and at the beginning of the trial the presiding judge said that kings by nature are a species of divinity and cannot do wrong. Therefore no issue of right and wrong could be introduced. Nothing about the fact that Charles I had broken the laws of England violated the duties of his office, waged war against his own people. None of those could be considered. The only question in that trial was, were these men involved in the trial and death of Charles I? That was all. So, very definitely, this was a very, very evil uh, act the restoration, because it worked to undo the Christian commonwealth that Cromwell had established. Now, with the revolution of 1688, what happened was that Parliament took over the same powers from the crown. So to this day, Parliament claims the rights that the crown did. And it is significant that those same powers are now now claimed by the federal government of the United States as having been inherited from the kings of England. Yes? Do uh, our churches in this country exempt from property tax, or did they lose that? They are, the churches in this country, still exempt from the property tax, but there are efforts now to challenge that exemption and to deny it. And I believe either San Francisco or Berkeley, is it Berkeley, is planning to try to tax the churches. I don't think it's Berkeley. (laughs) If it is, I haven't heard about it. Yes. One of the cities in the Bay Area, either San Francisco or Berkeley, that question is being raised and there is talk of passing legislation to tax the churches. Yes? I had a question on a historical principle. A lot of times I've heard people, I've been reared Catholic, Roman Catholic, and I was fortunately taught pretty good. And I will hear a Protestant talk, quote a Roman Catholic, and the Roman Catholic will throw an accusation at a particular group and they will quote the Roman Catholic on how terrible this group was. 
then I just sit back and say, boy, you know what, pal? Guess what he said about you? He said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, for example, Catholics have always practiced rebaptism. Mm -hmm. And they, oh yes, you, they'll never accept, they practice this day. If you wanted to join the Roman Catholic Church, they would rebaptize you. They would also, um, <clears throat> the Eastern Church practiced the same thing, and it was based on their view of the church. That, and, their, and, and then, and today, it was very interesting, certain uh, reform groups are calling themselves Catholic Reform. And a Catholic would sit back and look at that. I understand what they're saying about a unity of Christian, and I believe uh, there's a universal faith. You know, there's one faith. You know, there's 10 million different faiths. But they would sit back, and they would never consider you Catholic or Orthodox. And I, you know, when I look back and I see Augustine, and Augustine was very much a Roman Catholic, and how he would perceive, you know, the split of you know, of the Reformation. The Reformation was a big mistake in a Catholic's eyes. You see what I'm trying to say? In a point of, I see the principles you're, you were talking tonight are very important principles to understand because they undercut society. But the it, it, one, sometimes I see people quoting Roman Catholics and they're saying the same thing about you and I'm saying, well, what did they really mean? If they're going to quote you, say, you're this and this and then they'll lay the same accusation. I wonder why, they, were they just name-calling people? Well, the official position of the major Protestant groups as well as the Catholic Church is anti-Donatist. But there are a lot of pastors and priests out there who uh, believe in insurance, so they rebaptize very commonly. I've heard of instances like that. And and that is not uh, valid. Yes, that's true of marriages also. It's Donatism to do so. Yes. But you mentioned, uh, and of course, in your lecture you said we, re we really don't have a decision of where you draw the line of when the church goes into heresy uh, and still, still calls themselves Christian. Of course, in heaven... The Lord draws the line. We can see that from Revelations, but to the letters of the churches. But my problem is, uh, in my own thinking, you know, or at least I've had that problem. Is how do I? What do I do with certain groups? Nothing at all. Not, We're not the judge. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, how do I? Read? Well, I'm not trying to judge it. What I'm saying is. In other words, how do I deal with them? Do I deal if, if, do I deal with those groups in evangelism, or do I deal with them as uh, city brothers or something as Christians? Yeah, I don't. You deal with individuals, mm -hmm. not in terms of groups. You see, mm -hmm. you deal with individuals. Yes. I think your one of the big points in your lecture was that we don't perform the final judgment of a particular group. That you, Your point was that we have to deal with certain acts, how we respond to those acts of those individuals. Mm -hmm. And sit. And when a lot of people come, they go and say, that whole group's going to hell, and you know they play God in that direction. And, and I think that's very yes. dangerous. I have found people in the best churches whose faith was... <laughs> highly suspect. So you, you cannot judge in terms of groups. You, each individual stands before God in terms of what he is. He cannot say, look at me, Lord. I'm a Catholic or I'm a Protestant or I'm uh, an Orthodox uh, Calvinist or I'm this and that. That has no bearing on the other hand, while you don't make any final judgments about groups, if you're a part of a group, you do have to make a decision as far as separating yourself and when to True. separate yourself. And That's others. a personal judgment. I'm talking about judging others. You yourself have to make sure that you're where God wants you to be. Well, we do that by the necessity of the way we live our life. 
for example, a family will do things a certain way. That's not all that bad. Somebody has a particular way. Today we look and we talk about separation, and that's of necessity of how we we live our life mm-hmm. that we, you know, manifest that. Yes, but remember, the Donatists were the first separationists, well, and they uh, carried it to Phariseeism, and that is still happening with a lot of well, separationists. How you and your family. I'm not talking yes. about how you and your fa- how you might govern your family might be different than another Christian, but you may you two may mm-hmm. be the best of friends. Mm-hmm. You know. And yes. Yes. I just have a question uh, with regard to law enforcement. Since I mm-hmm. work for the sheriff's department, uh, since I've been attending these meetings, I'm a little more cognizant of uh, the government having too much authority, mm-hmm. uh, especially with relation to the family. And I run into uh, those who work in the youth division who have been given, uh, I believe, a little bit uh, too much authority with relation to children, uh, taking the children from the parents uh, under certain situations. And we have had what we call child beating cases that are very marginal. And uh, when I have a chance, I, I talk to these youth division officers and encourage them to be careful and not to go beyond uh, the beyond what they should as far as their authority, uh, uh, overstepping their authority. What uh, would you suggest that I could do in a constructive sort of way to uh, tone down some of the uh, cases? I would say you're doing very well. Our problem is that families are exercising less authority and the state is claiming more authority. And we have to work at both ends of this. We have to work to strengthen the family authority where we are and in every circle we're in. The family is the basic and essential governmental unit, the most essential. Yes. Have you heard any more on the case in Nebraska where they're uh, on the Christian school? No, except that uh, Pastor Sullivan was taken to jail again this week on Tuesday night. Uh, we should have a letter from him very shortly. Oh, I didn't realize he is in Nebraska. Yes. Was there any reason for why he was taken to jail again? They did not give him any reason, and the state uh, has since said that it was because he had not brought his school into line. However, the school had not yet been reopened, so they really jumped the gun. They came and arrested him with unmarked cars, sheriffs from another county, and took him to prison in another county. The time they picked him up, they did not say why they were arresting him. They simply came and seized him. At night, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Excuse me. I may be involved in a situation where I would be told by my superiors to make an arrest that I felt uh, would would not be legitimate. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering uh, how I should handle something like that. Well, since it's not a specific question, it's hard to answer, you know, because I don't know the specifics of the case. I would say that uh, if after, if you have a knowledge of the case, it's a detailed knowledge, just make your case known to your superiors and say that I do not feel that in this situation I can legitimately make the arrest because I do not believe it is valid.
Well, our time is up, so we'll adjourn and meet again at our next session. We'll continue our studies in the theology of the state.